Everybody, thank you so much for uh, joining us for today's webinar, Resilience and Engagement in Remote ABE and ESL Learning. Our presenter today is Mahila Kazma, and Burlington English is our sponsor today. Robert Breitbart was not able to join us, but he did send this video, so I'm going to go ahead and play this. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Robert Breitbart, Director of Educational Partnerships with Burlington English. And for so many years now, we've been able to partner with our great friends at COABE to bring you free of charge these fantastic webinars. And I'm particularly interested in today's topic, because if you know anything about Burlington, we really are perfect, whether you're doing on-site or online instruction or any combination of the two. So if this summer or come fall, you are back in the classroom, or if you continue to do instruction online, the same great in-class lessons from Burlington English or what's going to fill your whiteboard screen on site and your laptop if you're once again if you're teaching from home so we've got you covered regardless of where you call your classroom but of course the burlington blend is really something that programs find gets the most success for their learners and that means a seamless blend when students do independent or self-directed learner study and what do we mean by that well, for students learning from home, we're able to bring them truly anytime, anywhere learning opportunities. So our Burlington English student lessons, once again, are seamlessly blended to what you're going to be doing with your live instruction with your learners. Now, as a former teacher, I always love support. So just know whether you want to access Burlington English support uh, on your schedule, archived, on demand, or whether you'd like to join in on live interactive professional development that we offer, just know that all of our options are complimentary for those using Burlington English. Want to find out more or get even more professional development? Please reach out to my colleagues at burlingtonenglish.com slash contact. We'd love to connect with you. Now, back to our friends at COAB. Thanks so much. All right, I see so many of you using the chat function and introducing yourselves, that is great. However, if you could please change it to say all panelists and attendees, that way everybody can see what you're saying, that'd be wonderful. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Mahila. Thank you. Uh, okay, share screen.
Lindsay, can you hear me? Oh my God. Hello, Lindsay, can you hear me? Can you unmute it just to tell me if you can hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. Okay, uh, welcome everyone to engagement and resilient in resilience in ESLAB remote learning. And thank you for uh, choosing to be with us today. I will begin the session uh, with a quote from uh, Daniel Goldman's Emotional Intelligence book, which was published, published uh, 40 years ago. So this is what he said back then. I can foresee a day when education will routinely include inculcating essential human competences, such as self-awareness, self-control, and empathy. Now, as an adult educator, I have shared that vision and by that vision, I mean teaching to the effective domain. And in 2015, I became a certified resilience trainer with the HeartMath Institute. And ever since, um, I've brought self-regulation skills into my classes and the community. And you'll hear a lot today about the effective domain. And by that, I mean um, emotions, feelings, attitudes, mindsets, and even habits. My objectives for today are to summarize the why and how of promoting engagement and building resilience in remote ESLAB learning. I will give you an overview of cognitive, metacognitive, and effective domains and provide sample activities or strategies for each domain and domain integration whenever possible. And you will be engaged in practice and reflection. Um, my goal today is to also make it uh, exper experiential for you so you'll get a taste of uh, what my students get in remote learning. And uh, last but not least, a few tips for making the most of this session. The information is very dense and I talk a lot more than you have on the slides. I will use the cursor to highlight concepts as I detail them. Oops, sorry. Um, so it would be best to follow me rather than read the slides ahead of time. Also, uh, the last slide contains links to some of the resources I mentioned, and I will also put them in chat. I won't be able to monitor the chat except for when I ask you to contribute. And I was planning for some group activities but I just found out that we are in uh, webinar mode as opposed to meeting mode. So we can't do breakout rooms. We'll figure out another way uh, for, for your reflection activities. With the sudden uh, transition to remote learning in the quarter, in the spring quarter of 2020, as an educator, I asked myself uh, some questions. How can I make my students really look forward to my, my online class? How can I make them really be in the class and participate in the class and do the work beyond class? How can I uh, help them uh, navigate uh, 
the stressful period of the pandemic and again, the abrupt transition to online learning. So the answer was uh, promoting engagement and building resilience by addressing both the cognitive and the affective domains. Engagement ultimately translates into student retention and success and um, teaching students self-regulation skills and teaching to the affective domain uh, absolutely can help with the retention and success of the students. As regarding the cognitive domain, as educators, I think we are uh, so good and at um, reviewing curriculum, coming up with new curriculum, uh, adhering to new pedagogical trends. Uh, but maybe uh, what the area of adult education and in particular um, ESN and AB lack is addressing the affective domain. And like I said, this means emotions, attitudes, mindsets, and even habits. Now, the affective is recognized, is acknowledged in virtually all adult learning theory. But like I said, the cognitive is overemphasized in our practice. Today, I'm trying to um, give you a glimpse of how I address both the cognitive and the effective and I integrate them towards promoting engagement and building resilience in ESL and AB remote learning. And I will keep saying ESL and AB just because of the, um, the nature of the population uh, we serve in my program. We serve a large uh, immigrant refugee population uh, which after completion of the highest ESL level transition into AB where they function together in the same classes with um, native speakers placing below college level work. In terms of content, um, in terms of the cognitive, I will talk about the content, the four connections framework and metacognitive skills. Although as we will see in metacognitive skills, are a bridge between the cognitive and the affective. The next three slides will address the cognitive. I'll make sure uh, to draw your attention on that. They are also uh, labeled and highlighted in yellow. And then the following three slides address the affective, uh, labeled and highlighted in, in this color. And, um, Within the effective, uh, we'll talk about the importance of teaching awareness of mental emotional processes, helping students explore attitudes, mindsets, and feelings, and uh, teaching or embedding self-regulation techniques. On to the cognitive, I'll briefly uh, visit the content. My take on content is that it should be progressive and recycled, and it should provide relevance and enjoyment. You probably know that according to research, there is no learning or very little learning without enjoyment and relevance. You have an example here of a student-generated list uh, on a topic pertaining to remote learning. The topic is how to be successful in online classes or remote learning. This is a list generated by students in small groups in breakout rooms then together with a whole class. Uh, this is a good way to uh, introduce them to uh, the concept of remote learning, but also, um, it's not enough to do it at the beginning of the quarter. Uh, the list is revisited while uh, more knowledge is added in terms of grammar structures or language structures. 
So for example, here under uh, grammar structures, uh, I have some of the structures uh, we studied in a quarter, like should have two adjectives and noun phrases plus infinitive and verb tenses. So um, as we were adding each of the structures, the students had to revisit the list and um, express the items on the list with the new structures. So for example, I should participate in all Zoom classes or uh, it is a good idea to schedule extra time to study on my own or verb tenses. I haven't done all Canvas work, but I commit to doing that. Uh, the topic here again is uh, a student generated list on remote learning, but it can be any topic uh, you teach. And I found out that student generated material whether it's lists or any other kind of material um, is uh, more appealing to students to be uh, for, for revisiting throughout the quarter. Now to compensate for face-to-face uh, -face speaking and interaction, uh, which happens in, a, in an on-campus class, I use uh, what is called the jam technique, the just a minute technique. Uh, maybe you are familiar with that. It can be done uh, in groups or it can be done with a whole class depending on the size of your class. The jam technique, the just a minute technique has very three simple steps. Uh, if we have time at the end, I will give you a topic and the topic will be our topic for today, engagement and resilience, right? And the steps are the following. Talk for one minute, no notes, don't stop and don't repeat information. Step two, organize your ideas from step one by taking notes and talk for one minute using notes. And step three, organize or add more notes to step two and talk for one minute with or without your notes. Uh, I found this uh, technique um, very useful, again, to compensate for the interaction in the face-to-face -face classes because, um, and, and absolutely you can have any other kinds of activities, but uh, students prepare their short speeches and uh, they, they give their short speeches to um, their classmates. And it's a good way to uh, practice their vocabulary, their grammar on the content um, taught each week. Continuing with a cognitive domain, um, I try to address the four connections framework. Some of you um, might be familiar with that. Uh, this framework is based on uh, Odessa College's Drop Rate Improvement Program. It consists of actually intuitional practices that, um, if used intentionally and continuously, can improve interactions with students. The four connections are interacting with students by name, checking in regularly, scheduling one-on-one -on -one meetings, and practicing paradox. And this last one, practicing paradox, is the one I pay special attention and will exemplify today. Um, so practicing paradox means structure your course clearly, communicate your expectations regularly, then be reasonably flexible when students have concerns. So basically, it's maintaining that balance between uh, rigor and flexibility. And we really needed a lot of flexibility uh, with the, like I said, um, sudden transition to remote learning. So here are a few examples of how I practice um, paradox. 
I clearly communicate the expectations for participation in terms of inclusiveness and flexibility to maximize teacher-student and student-student interaction in each class. And the example you have here is rules for Zoom class participation. Now, I literally begin every Zoom class with the agenda for the day and with these rules. So students understand very clearly that my responsibilities, um, one of my responsibilities is to make each student speak at least once, and I call students by name, but they also have responsibilities to speak at least one more time, and they can volunteer to read, answer questions from teachers or classmates or any other kinds of activities. And you might find this mentioned trivial, but um, I had students who got very upset when I muted everyone and, and they were talking. So I have this mention, if there is too much noise, the teacher will mute all students and mute yourself when you speak in class. Uh, this is a good way to communicate and constantly remind expectations for participation just in the Zoom classes, okay? Um, another uh, strategy I use is administering weekly short surveys, and they can be multiple choice, true, false, yes, no, on syllabus sections and level of comfort in the class. Of course, at the beginning of the quarter, we discuss the syllabus, we have a quiz and so on. But as we progress um, in the quarter, we revisit various sections to make sure students understand and are comfortable with everything that happens in the class. And the example I have here, a very, very easy survey that I do now and then, for me, this class is easy, just right, difficult, or other. So it helps me gauge my teaching. If there is a, a sizable number of students who have difficulties, I would try to find out what they are. If there are just particular students um, in this situation, I would reach out just to them and ask them how to support them. I also try to clarify the expectations on promotion and grading. And I understand this can be very different at different colleges. In, um, in my program, we don't use decimal grades. Um, our grades just reflect students' readiness for the next step to move on to the next level. So I make sure I convey that very clearly to the students. So I take, uh, I, I relieve some of the pressure uh, they have culturally or from, from their um, family members. And uh, we, we discuss together their readiness. So there are two choices at the end of the quarter when we have the teacher student conferences uh, you have made progress and you are ready for the next level, or you have made progress, but you have made some progress, but you might benefit from one more quarter at this level. So there is no pass fail uh, and no stigma attached to spending more than one quarter at a level. Now we don't want um, more, more than two quarters at the same level, but two quarters should be fine. On to metacognitive skills that are bridging the cognitive and affective. Metacognitive um, implies awareness of uh, one's thinking and learning and also awareness of oneself as a thinker and as a learner. In my classes, and of course, uh, the extent to what I'm teaching these concepts varies per class, I try to address 
uh, learning styles, brain dominance, study skills, test taking strategies, and emotions and learning. And I teach a regular ESL class, but I also teach uh, a special class that is multi-level for upper ESL and AB students. That class is called Learning Strategies. And uh, in that class, I'm lucky enough to uh, address all these concepts as well as um, address the effective domain in more detail and include self-regulation skills. When we talk about the cognitive and the affective, we know that um, the Western education system favors the cognitive over the affective, but what do you think? Which of the assessments below is a better predictor of student performance? Assessment of the cognitive domain or assessment of the affective domain? Can you please uh, type your answers in chat? And Okay, so at the beginning, uh, I said that I won't be able to monitor chat unless I ask you to um, to answer my questions. So this is the time when you can when you can type in chat. The question was, which of the assessments below is a better predictor of student performance? Assessment of the cognitive domain or assessment of the affective domain? And I will answer some questions. Um, is anyone looking at the questions? I'm looking for specific questions and maybe at the end I will look at all of them. Um, and yes, you will get these slides later. They will be... Um, they will be emailed to you, I understand, uh, within 24 hours. And I have a question here from Laura. Uh, some instructors believe that making students speak in class by calling on them raises their effective filter, decreasing their learning. Uh, I would say yes and no. Once you establish a relationship with your students, and you call students by their first name and you say, would you like to answer this question? Are you interested in answering this question? They can say yes or no, and I can move on to the next student. Okay, so I, I don't see the answers in chat for some reasons. Uh, let me look again. Okay, now I can see some answers. Effective, but cognitive. Okay, where was that? But cognitive is also important, of course. Uh, the question is, which one is a better predictor? Um, even if it's slightly better, right? Both should be a good predictor. Effective because it is performance being measured. Okay, effective. Some Shirley says, I feel both. Uh, let's see, do we have anything else? Both, affective, affective, cognitive, affective. So um, a good example for choosing the affective domain, very intelligent students who are upset or bored do not perform well as a result, correct. 
cognitive, both, both, affective, 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 both. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have um, a mixture of answers. Um, according to research, the answer is the affective domain is a better predictor of, of student success. I mean, assessment of the affective domain is a better predictor of student success than assessment of the cognitive domain. Uh, a lot of you said both, and maybe they are very close, but um, think about this. When do we do, when do we assess the affective domain? We only assess the cognitive domain. Okay, so uh, on to talking about how the affective domain might look in practice. As we know, uh, emotions can influence, that is block or enhance learning, but also learning can shape new emotions and attitudes. I see our my role as an educator uh, in helping maintain or tilt that balance towards learning to, to shape um, new attitudes and to um, address those uh, emotions, those uh, affective um, skills of students that prevent them from being successful in the class. We started talking about the affective domain, right? So almost everything from here will be uh, a discussion on the affective domain. And these are some examples of how the affective domain uh, might look in practice. This is um, how I work with emotions in the classroom. I use the worry box, breathing techniques, activating renewing feelings, reflection and journaling and discussion. Now, by no means uh, is this an exhaustive list of what I use or uh, what is out there in, in the field. The worry box, uh, you have it on uh, the last slide. It can be used in, in many ways. I use it as a meditation in which students are invited uh, at the beginning of the class to identify um, a worry or uh, a problem or even a recurring thought that might prevent them from focusing in the class and giving their full and undivided attention to, to the class. They imagine a box um, in which they put that worry and they close the box and they put the box um, someplace in their home, on a shelf, in another room, it doesn't matter. With the idea that they would open that box later after class. It can be a long meditation on, or a short meditation on um, the last slide, you have a long one and um, students can even imagine decorating the box and, and other activities. Um, you, can, you can do it in, in any version and there is a lot of information on the internet about this technique. Uh, the, tech, the, the example that I have on the resource slide is for more advanced students for a longer meditation and um, there is listening and reading involved. The breathing techniques, um, by now we all know uh, they are very useful. Uh, the breathing techniques I engage, are, I, I employ are um, uh, developed by the uh, Heart Math Institute, and one of them is called the Heart Focused Breathing, and uh, the other one, whether we'll be using activating renewing feelings, is called Quick Coherence. 
So for now, uh, let's look into uh, the hard focused breathing. For the breathing pace, I use um, these breathing shapes from the internet. You have the link on the resource slide. Okay. And I would basically choose any of these. There are, uh, there are 10 of them. Some are more fun than others, but alternating them is, um, is a good idea. And let's choose one for today. For example, is this one. Sync your breathing with this shape. The heart uh, focus breathing involves not just um, deep uh, and slow breaths, which you can do by following this shape, right? So inhale as the shape expands and exhale as the shape collapses, but also keep your focus on the heart, okay? It's not just regular deep breaths, it's also keeping the focus on the heart. Now you can do that by gently tapping on your heart or placing your palm over your heart. And as you follow the shape and sink your breath, try to keep the focus on your heart. Just like try to, to, to be there in your heart. It can be difficult for some people. That's why I was suggesting tapping or placing your palm over your heart. But um, it can be very useful because it will um, prevent your monkey mind for jumping all over the place. Even if you sink your breathing with this shape, your mind can go someplace else but keeping the focus on your, on your heart um, would help stabilize your mind as well. This um, is due to, to the heart-brain connection. The heart and brain communicate through a neuronal network and there is more information sent from the heart to the brain than vice versa. Uh, I teach my students all that. I'm not going to go through details, but I want you to um, really make a sincere attempt to try this technique. And um, it's deceptively simple, but it has um, amazing effects, especially cumulative effects. And I told my students, um, they will be able to address any issue better, to focus better. Their learning process, their presence will be, will, will be enhanced, okay? So let's try to do it for uh, a while, a short while, one or two minutes together. So place your palm on your heart, keep your attention on the heart and breathe in. and out. And in. And out. And continue on your own, keeping your attention, your focus on the heart.
Thank you. And you can take a few seconds uh, to really to really sink in and see how it feels for you. You don't have to type in chat or anything. Now with students, again, I would use this technique at the beginning of the class or um, in the middle of the class, if I start with a worry box, sometimes I do both, sometimes uh, I do just one of them. But breathing techniques are especially useful before tests and presentations. Now we are moving on to activating renewing feelings, which is uh, building on the heart focus breathing. So continuing with the affective, awareness, self-awareness of feelings is the first step in self-regulation. And I teach my students um, that we can create, conjure, experience emotions at will. We don't have to wait for our surrounding for the external environment to trigger emotional responses, okay? This is the slide I use with my students. There is much more teaching associated with it than I'll be able to, to do right now. Uh, this is a picture from my face-to-face -face class and I make sure I tell students they are not missing anything uh, from the content. It's just, uh, different ways of, of delivering the content. The content. I would like uh, you to identify your emotional state. How are you doing? Are you feeling overwhelmed, anxious, worried, angry? Or are you grateful, appreciated, appreciative, confident, compassionate, and of course, the, the list can be much longer. It doesn't have to be one of these emotions here. Just take a few seconds and have that inner connection and identify your state right now. It's probably not that bad after the heart focused breathing. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, please try to do that. You don't have to type in chat. These examples of emotions are in red and these are in blue. And uh, I, I try to make the distinction between them, not by calling them good or bad, uh, because we are human and we experience a wide range of emotions every day, every week, but by considering emotions from the perspective of uh, what they do to our energy systems and our mental cognitive functions. You might have noticed that um, when you have an episode of anger or anxiety, or if you feel overwhelmed, you feel a little bit tired afterwards. Um, that is because these emotions are draining you. The biochemistry associated with this emotion is draining. Um, your energy system. So we would call these emotions depleting, okay? And every time we experience one of these depleting emotions for five minutes or more, and again, there are so many others, a cascade of 1400 biochemicals is released into the blood and it circulates for up to 12 hours. 
One of those biochemicals is cortisol, the hormone of stress. So it's not about um, being guilty that we experience these emotions. It's about being aware uh, what we experience and um, trying to, to self-regulate, to offset uh, the energy drain and the impact on our mental cognitive function. On the other hand, these emotions in blue energize you, right? When, when you feel appreciated, when you feel confident, when somebody pays you a compliment, you feel better all of a sudden. And that is because the biochemistry of these emotions, and we call them renewing emotions, they renew your energy systems and your mental cognitive functions. Okay. Uh, every time we experience one of these emotions for five minutes or more, a cascade uh, of 1400 biochemicals, so same number as for depleting emotions, is released into the blood but, and, and circulate for 12 hours, but they have um, beneficial effects um, on, our, on our body chemistry. One of those uh, hormones is the, the dehydroepiandosterone, short DHEA. Some of you might be familiar with it. It's um, associated with vitality and uh, youth and rejuvenation and improved immune functions. And doctors prescribe it for um, memory improvement and anti-aging. And you can even find it over the counter in health food stores. But the point I communicate with my students is that by learning to self-regulate, we can be in control of our uh, inner chemistry. And by that, we can literally improve our mental cognitive functions, our success as a student, not to mention our health and our relationships and all aspects of our lives. So with that, we are transitioning into activating renewing feelings and practicing a technique that builds on the heart-focused breathing. I would like you to make a sincere attempt right now to feel confident, okay? This is one emotional state a lot of our students uh, struggle with. So make a sincere attempt to feel confident, to experience, conjure confidence. Well, you can do that um, very easily if you are naturally a confident person or you can, if you're not, you can use a memory of a time when you felt confident, when you felt successful, when um, you are complimented for a job well done or any other kind of, of event or situation where you felt very good about yourself and very confident, okay? Use that memory to trigger confidence, but then feel confidence in your heart. I'm giving you a few seconds to do that. Your body doesn't know the difference between now and then. That's why using a memory works. But once you activated the memory, try to keep that feeling in your heart.
keeping that feeling of confidence in your heart, we are going to engage in the next technique in which you feel confident and add the heart focus breathing. So you will do uh, three things at the same time, a uh, deep, slow, regular breath, a focus on the heart. Again, tap or um, place your palm over the heart if necessary. And also maintaining that feeling of confidence. Okay. I'm going to do a, a demonstration. Okay, this uh, device, it's called an M wave records the heart um, rhythm patterns. And the heart rhythm patterns varies, vary with um, emotions and um, clearly show, this recording will clearly show the transition to self-regulation, to engaging in the technique. So um, you can, Actually, I invite you to, to do it with me. You can um, regulate your breath by using this breather here. So breathe out when the blue line goes all the way down and in as the blue line um, goes all the way in. If that is comfortable for you, if not find your own uh, breathing pace, just remember uh, your breath has to be deep and slow. And all this time you keep your focus on the heart and you maintain that feeling of confidence. Okay. So I'm going to uh, stop talking and engage in the technique. I will leave the recording run for uh, one or two minutes. And then I stop, we'll, we'll discuss the recording and um, you'll, you'll have an opportunity to share and ask questions, okay? Again, I invite you to do this with me. Keep that feeling of confidence in your heart. Keep the focus on your heart and breathe slowly and deeply.
and I stopped the recording. You can see I, um, I practiced the technique for uh, about two minutes. And if you can notice the difference between the recording before the technique and after I started the technique. Uh, you can see how uh, my heart rhythm pattern is disordered, chaotic, and um, that was absolutely influenced by the pressure I felt uh, because I, I needed to do a demo. So no matter um, how many times I've done this with my students, uh, there is still a little bit of pressure and anxiety. And I was also explaining to you how to do it, okay? So you can see, this is an incoherent heart rhythm pattern, which is scientifically proven to inhibit brain function. When I stopped talking and uh, I activated confidence, and um, I did the heart focus breathing at the same time, my heart rhythm pattern changed. Look how orderly and coherent it has become. Now, we call this a coherent heart rhythm pattern, and it is known to facilitate brain function. Everything um, I share with you when I bring in the uh, science is, is uh, backed by over 20 years of, of research with the uh, HeartMath Institute. So just know I'm not making this up. In a face-to-face -face class on campus, each of my students would get to, to try this technology, but in remote learning, we um, engage, uh, I engage in demonstration, they do the technique with me. And many times, and this is what you can do as well, since you don't have, um, or maybe many of you wouldn't have uh, any biofeedback uh, tool, you can still use these breathing shapes. Okay, and again, you can, change them from one practice to the other, okay? It's just that you add the activating the feeling component to the heart focus breathing. So you would begin with that, activate the feeling, whether just naturally or using a memory, trying to keep the feeling in the heart, Focus on the heart and sink um, your breath with a shape. This is uh, how I also do it with students. So there is more, more variation. Okay, so now back to the chat. Your, your turn. Um, if you could type how it worked for you, if you think it would be useful um, for you or for your students. I tell my students, this is a wonderful technique to use uh, before a test or a presentation or um, whenever you're stressed about uh, your, your interactions especially given your language barriers and, and um, cultural barriers. Interesting, I think my students will love this. Great for me and students. I want to get a biofeedback tool. On the last slide, you have um, a link to the research page of the Heart Math Institute. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not advertising for, for uh, anyone. 
I'm just presenting you the tools that uh, I use with my students. Uh, but hard math do have a lot of research about using these techniques in colleges and universities. And Stanford, I believe, had a project uh, where they monitored the use of these techniques, uh, both with their staff and faculty. So you can read more about that and also find out more about um, this tool uh, using that link. Uh, thanks so much. Could you show your resources, please? Yes. Uh, okay, oops. How do I do this? I'm going directly to the last slide. Okay. So in this last slide, you have uh, the jump technique, the four connections, the worry box, the breathing shapes. This is a very fun um, brain dominance test where students get to uh, do things kinesthetically. And this is a link to the heart math education research. So there you can find all the resources you need. And um, again, you'll have this recording sent to you within uh, 24 hours, but let me see. I'm going to copy them and put them in chat right away. Okay, so you already have them, but you will have them uh, with a recording as well. Okay, so now back to, to your thoughts. Um, great techniques for breathing. I would have liked more on effective assessments. Yes, I don't have that. Thank you for the suggestion. The time was also short for, for the webinar. Oh, actually it's past time. So um, thank you for your, for your feedback. Uh, somebody says, I have used biofeedback in previous practicum experience, loved it. Great, thank you. Delivering, I'm experienced with delivering guided Im imagery. Yes, uh, and, and the worry box is an example of this. Yes, I will definitely try this with my students. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you, thank you for your feedback. I do have some more slides to share if, if you're still here. So let me make this in presentation mode. These are some assignment examples for my ESLAB learning strategies class. It's a multi-level class for higher levels and that's where I um, integrate metacognitive and effective skills uh, with the content to the largest extent of all my other classes. You have an example of a discussion on the effects of stress. Um, I let you read that. You have examples of uh, reflections on gem resilience and emotions and reflection on situational awareness. I'm going to read aloud the reflection on gem resilience emotions. Go over the PowerPoint presentation and then using the GEM technique, prepare your one minute speech on this topic. Then deliver your one minute speech to a friend or family member. After that, write a six to eight sentence paragraph about your experience. Describe how you prepared for the speech. What new words and concepts did you use? Were you able to pronounce them correctly? Did your friend or family member understand the topic? What questions did they have for you? at the end of your speech, were you able to answer them, okay? Another example of uh, reflection about situational awareness in which students have to recall a situation, um, a recent situation or a misunderstanding they experienced in the class community or neighborhood. And I have a few examples, speaking, presenting in class, taking a test, calling services on the phone, talking to neighbors or somebody was rude to them. They have to describe what happened, how did they feel, what did they do back then, and how will you use the techniques that we learn in the future 
if you encounter this type of situation. Okay. This is an example of reading practice where they have to summarize a text and the text was, of course, about uh, the brain power, uh, a discussion on test taking strategies. And I like to review the material by asking uh, students to uh, put together small projects, small PowerPoint presentations. Each student would choose a topic for example, the effects of stress, emotions and resilience, boost your brain power, test taking strategies, self-confidence or presenting with self-confidence and many others. So they have to prepare their PowerPoint presentation and uh, their speech on it and deliver it in the Zoom class. And I would just like to show you uh, a few examples of student projects. From uh, last two quarters, this one is on emotions and resilience. And I quickly browse through them. You can see how they um, have to explain the concepts that I mentioned today. Okay. Perhaps it's not what I wanted. This one is present on presenting with self confidence. They incorporate the technique that I shared with you today. Okay, and I prepared many more to show you, but we are way past time. So I'm going to conclude here with an invitation to reflect on your favorite tips and techniques, which unfortunately won't be able to share unless you want to type in chat um, and a reflections on the questions below. And the questions are, was there an aha moment for you during the presentation? And how can you apply what you learned today to your class? I just found out at the beginning um, of the session that this is a webinar mode, not a meeting mode. Um, so I can't make groups, breakout rooms, um, but I would greatly appreciate if you keep these thoughts, continue reflect um, on the effective domain, the importance and the tools to integrate the effective domain in adult basic education and do share your thoughts in chat if you are so inclined to do and uh, you have the time. I'm especially interesting if there was an aha moment for you during the presentation. This is very timely information for me, and I am so grateful to you for presenting this information. Thank you, thank you everyone. I am very grateful to all of you for joining me today. Thank you so much, Mahila. Everybody, I am launching a poll. It should be on your screen now. If you could please take a minute to answer the one question, we'd be grateful. Thank you everybody for joining us.